Well, welcome again to the Brand Ambassador Series. Uh, we're going to Texas today with Tim yeah, Tate. That's Tim, right. Thank you very much Thanks for being here. Thanks for having here. us. Really appreciate it. Uh, well, you're a very courageous man <laughs> because making whiskey in Texas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and being so innovative as you are Thanks. requires a lot of lot of courage. <laughs> and, and, and but please tell us about it. Well. Um, yeah, and the Texas part is really important in terms of we're trying to not just make whiskey in Texas, but make Texas whiskeys. And right. so, of course, the next question is, what does that mean? It, it really just means that, first, we're trying to make new styles of whiskey that are, of course, riffs off of other styles, as most whiskeys are, but also work with flavors and characteristics that, that fit, that have a certain terroir. Mm -hmm. of, uh, in where we are. So the brimstone would be the most obvious expression of that in terms of having an oak smoked whiskey. Right. But, um, you know, I think another part of that that plays into the flavors is the heat. And so, you know, traditional distillers will tell you, well, this is a horrible idea. You have to have a very wet, cool place to age spirits. And I would, you know, reply, that's true if you make them this wet. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just like cooking. There's some things that you can cook a certain way in an oven, a cool oven. There are other things you can do with a high flame, right. but you need to not confuse the two because they do different things yeah. and you may need to use different ingredients. So um, one of the key aspects of that, um, ironically, we do actually use quite cool fermentations. I'm a big advocate of long, cool fermentation and All not right. working yeast to death. Um, to some degree, you see that more in the whiskey industry than you would in our distillery in terms of uh, fermentations that aren't really attempered, so they'll, you know, end basically when the yeast dies. We try not to do that mm -hmm. for heat reasons. Um, at the same time, the, the barrel aging, um, you know, we have a 65,000 square foot, you could say, vault, this big brick and concrete building, and so in the summer it's going to get quite warm. The most important part of that for me then is the quality of the oak. So you know that you're going to get a lot of oak extraction. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to use the very finest quality oak, which obviously can be about which trees and everything else, but I mean full yard-aged oak, fine grain oak, oak that's properly toasted, more emphasis on toast than char. They are charred, mm -hmm. but you know, mixing the right combination of woods. So most of what we use be the traditional, you know, Cuerca Salba, um, American oak, but there is some European oak, right. there is some French oak, and they all have their purpose in, in, in the blends of the whiskey, so. Well, we are going to have to go through all of those, all of those things. Um, before this, mm -hmm. can you just give us a, a very quick rundown sure. on, on those bottles? Yeah, absolutely. We've got, uh, we've got six, six bottles out, six labels, and they fit basically into three classes. So we have our malt whiskey, mm -hmm. which we have one label for. I'll talk about that a little later. We have three corn whiskeys. Uh, the baby blue, the true blue, and the brimstone. Uh, the most important thing to understand about those is we're trying to kind of do a varietal corn whiskey. We're trying to make a uh, mature corn whiskey that tastes like corn, where the barrel is there in support of the grain and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And then we have our rumble, which is just a curious thing that I do because I own a distillery and so I can. Um, it actually has a little bit of a culinary background in terms of this started as a dessert sauce and I was pulling different ingredients together that I thought complemented each other to sort of form, you know, compositionally what I wanted. And it was sort of a knockoff of Bananas Foster. I flashed it and I said, I need to ferment and distill this. So that was the birth of Rumble. Um, the other significance of that actually is that, you know, we get our malt, our corn, our oak, whatever, from wherever it's best. But we still definitely have a deep respect, appreciation, a love of where we're from and the flavors there. The figs, the honey, these are things in Texas. This is Texas wildflower honey. This is Sugarland Texas sugar. Mm -hmm. These are figs that are now mostly grown in Texas. I'm a little picky about the figs, so sometimes we have to pull in from a few other places. But they're definitely the flavors of Texas. Okay. And so that seemed like an appropriate thing to combine those to form a unique Texas spirit. Lovely. Let's go back to the raw materials. Mm -hmm. um, of the whiskey and I guess the corn. Right. How special is that? Is that corn? Um, it's you know we think it's pretty special. It's um, 
there's a lot of parallels that I use to wine in terms of there's really no using, reason to use wine grapes except for their flavor. They're difficult to grow, they're more prone to disease than other things. You know, why not use Mustang grapes to make great French wine? Well, it just doesn't come out the same. Mm -hmm. And so people work with all of the shortcomings in that sense of, of the grape, the difficulties. The blue corn's the same way. Uh, the only reason to use it is the flavor. It's, you know, it's an heirloom variety. It's not as uh, disease resistant. It does as, produces much per acre. It's harder to grind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's got a really rich, earthy, flinty, um, not just sort of your typical field corn flavor. And so that's what I want to bring out. So the roasting even brings it out a bit more in terms of heightening the oil components, mm -hmm. which is another um, important thing about how we ferment that. Um, as I'm, I'm sure you know, you, oily components, you can, you can dissolve them obviously in other oils or in alcohols. And so there's a bit of a maceration that goes on in our long cool fermentation. Mm -hmm. Those roasty notes are not really fully into the wash until maybe day four, day five, right, as right. the alcohol content's coming up. And so then once that happens, we can bring it into the still and carry it forward oh, in the whiskey. And you, and you take it uh, whole to the still or you filter a bit? No, 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 we don't filter at all. Um, one thing that's really important to understand about our stuff, I always say that if, if there's anything that you know is actually swimming around in the whiskey, then call me about it, but otherwise don't. Um, we do filter in just in a standard sort of way, but it's about as close as you can get to just, you know, thieving a bit out of the barrel and putting it in the glass. Okay. You know, you will see, we use a mineral water, Balcones, we're on the Balcones fault line which is, you know, we could go into that, but basically the deep aquifers trickle up through the rock face, mm -hmm. come to the distillery and provide us the spring water. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's higher mineral than other times. Oh, and so when sometimes when it's a, higher mineral, you you'll get... Check on the, on, the, on the supply? We could. We just, we like it. I taste it. I don't analyze it. I could analyze it. I'm quite, you know, nerdy that way. But when the calcium, the magnesium content's higher, you may see a bit of snow. You can definitely see uh -huh. a bit of haze. Right. Some of that are the typical sort of oily characters that you get in whiskey, but we don't always demineralize the way a lot of distilleries, and yeah. perhaps we should, but I just, we're so focused on trying to almost push too hard to get people to say, don't, you know, you don't insist on absolute clarity anymore in your beer. Mm -hmm. You don't insist it in your wine. Just keep going. Yeah. Spirits can be the yeah, same way. Exactly. And obviously, you know, at different proofs. So, you know, the whiskey is crystal clear. Mm -hmm. It's more when you dilute down right. below about 50%, you've got more alcohol in water than yeah, water and alcohol. Yeah. And so it starts, you know. But that's a big thing for us. We're really much more focused on the flavors and the aromas um, than we are just the typical cosmetic concerns. They're beautiful to us, but it's, it's, it's a matter of interpretation. That's what counts. Yeah. Um, then when, when you have those long cold fermentations, mm -hmm. is this because you are controlling the temperatures or you just let it be? Right, yeah. Excess, so it, As it we get, get well, we have, we have air conditioning in the space where we ferment. Right. And so at some point we'll, and I look forward to having, you know, uh, cooling systems for the fermenters, but right now they're just open and they're wide enough and they're small enough that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of ballistic so I can, I can start at this temperature and add this amount of yeast and know that it won't get above this certain okay. temperature. Draft fire. So in the summer, that does make it a lot more of a challenge. Yes, we have air conditioning, but still, you know, you've got huge fires under yeah. stills, it gets warm in there. And so I have to kind of adjust, basically, anticipate the current temperature, what the temperatures will be in the distillery based on what we're going to be doing the next few days, and adjust the starting temperature accordingly. Mm -hmm. So rather than starting at, say, 67 degrees, starting at 64 degrees, right. which doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's enough. The primary thing that's changing the temperature, of course, is the activity of the yeast. Yeah. And so by starting that much cooler, the start is much, much slower. And of course, the critical period, I mean, it's all important, but the critical period is really the first three or four days in terms of, um, on the one hand, creating the, the esters and the fruity aromas that you're looking for right. and not the others as well as not creating excessive fusel alcohols. That's, that's really a key thing for us, um, both in terms of just strictly practical reasons, making the best quality we can, but also in terms of style. I'm trying to make things that, yes, are not as long aged. Perhaps we'll age things longer as we're older. We're a four-year-old distillery. We're not going to have a 10-year-old product at this point. Mm -hmm. But the concept that goes along with that is to ferment mash, choose ingredients, all of these things carefully enough 
that I can take something that, while it's not mature, is very rich and very smooth right off of the stove. Right. And, you know, you've had various degrees of new make whiskeys that become great whiskeys, but off of the still, they can, they can be a bit much. Yep. Because they plan to age them often in fully charred barrels, six years, eight years, 10 years. And so it's fine, it's, that's gonna come, that's part of their method that produces those flavors that yeah. we love. But since I don't plan to do that, because I'm not using such heavy chars, I really wanna make sure that it's a clean yeah. distillate, rich, full, aromatic, but clean, so the barrels can simply just mature the whiskey and not have to sort of take those rough edges off. But then, if you have long fermentations, okay, mm -hmm. so maybe you've got the, the right profile of esters that, mm -hmm. that, that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You get rid maybe of some disetol that's created if it's long enough, but don't you have a problem of um, maybe bacterial infection? It's No, no, and that's, it really comes down to cleanliness. You gotta be clean, if you're clean. And you know, um, I, have a background before distilling and brewing. And so the cleanliness needed in the distiller is nothing compared to a brewery, right. especially when you're making unpasteurized products that could be fine when they leave the brewery. But what about a month later? What yeah. about once somebody, which they shouldn't, leaves it hot for a few days and it puts it back? So, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, knock on wood, that, that hasn't been a problem for us because we're fairly meticulous mm -hmm. um, some of the distillers might say, I'm a bit anal about making sure that those things are properly done, that everything is sanitized properly, rinsed properly so that we don't have the residues of those things. But you can't just use any water because you might reinfect fermenters, hoses, mm -hmm. valves. The things that when I was doing brewing, you, you especially hoses and valves, hoses and valves, yeah, yeah, you really yeah, have to watch headaches. this. They can be headaches and they tend to be headaches that spin out of control if you let them get out of control. Right. And well, the yeast itself, mm -hmm. uh, you're just buying uh, any yeast, you have your particular strain? You we have our particular strains. Somewhere. No, I mean, we use our particular strains. We're not big enough at this point. There are some yeasts that I would like to use. You know, we're using dried yeasts or, or we're, we're not culturing yeast because on the sanitation is interesting. We're very careful with the sanitation in some respects. So what I mean is we do get a lactic fermentation at the end mm -hmm. of the corn and the malt on purpose because of the way that I do it. Right, right. Um, there's a little bit of sort of maybe a Belgian brewing tradition there. All parts of the distillery are scrubbed, the corners and all that. The ceiling is not. The ceiling is brushed every so often. That's where we're keeping a certain balance of the lactic, not acetic and so forth that I want in there to make sure that not at the beginning, but four and a half, five days right. in, things start and give a nice acid structure to what I'm looking for in the mm -hmm. still, which of course isn't natural to the corn, to the, uh, to the malt. So um, we use commercially available yeasts, but some of those we've had to push a bit to get into these country. They, this country, they aren't uh, uncommon in other places. Mm -hmm. um, some of the traditional strains used in the UK for malt whiskey, um, some that have been developed and are used, but not necessarily as much for rum. They actually are making a rum. It's, mm -hmm. you try if you like, well, I don't know if I have it with me. Anyway, made it on Sunday for the first time, so it's not oh. quite ready yet. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, that is another thing. Um, obviously, if you can take the trouble to set up these ideal fermentation conditions, you want to make sure you have the right players involved. And so we will typically use multiple yeast strains. Mm -hmm. um, in brief, one sort of workhorse yeast strain that's going to help make sure everything's proceeding along and one that will come in sooner that's more focused on particular aromatic qualities, ester profiles, and things mm -hmm. like that. 